Thank you for having me here. Um, there's my brother. Hi. Um, so I will start by telling you my story. I think that's the easiest way to explain how I've arrived where I have. And that is that I was just like every young person, I think, in the world who loves animals, right, as a little kid. And, um, you know, when you're a kid, your parents don't usually tell you where your food comes from, probably because they want you to eat. And, um, but <clears throat> I loved animals so much. And one day I was actually on the airplane with my brother, and who is here, and um, has a booth here, Silver Dragon. Um, but he and I were on the airplane eating next to each other, and he started, as you know, brothers taunt their sisters, make the sounds of the food that I was eating, which happened to be lamb. And this was so disturbing to me. I had never considered that lamb was actually lamb. And so this really threw me, and I went home and was immediately vegetarian, but I had no idea what that meant, so I just ate ice cream and eggs and french fries, and that was not very healthy, but that's how I ate for a while. And um, I had no example of it around me. There wasn't a ton, t vegetarianism wasn't everywhere. I didn't know any else, anyone else who was, so it was easy for me to sort of forget about it. But in my soul, I had connected that day with the idea that I did not want to hurt animals. And so years went by and I did what I, in my book, The Kind Diet, I, call, I talk about what I call flirting with the diet. And when I, um, when I, from this age of about 18 to 21, I did what I call flirting. I knew it's what my heart wanted, but my, first of all, I loved meat. And um, I think I was being selfish in the sense that I just thought, well, I like it, so I'm going to eat it. And, no, and I didn't know enough to stop. So at 21, I saw a documentary on how they raise animals for food. And this film, well, the one that I saw that really freaked me out was The Witness. And it's a great movie if you ever want to see it about this guy from the Bronx who hates animals, but he likes this girl. And the only way that he can get into this girl's life or into her bed is to take care of her cat. And on this journey, he finds a real love for animals. And it's a really beautiful story, but it's so heartbreaking. So. Um, this story freaked me out because it shows you the behind the scenes of what goes on to make your food. And it really, really freaked me out. And um, so at 21, I had this awakening of, wait a second, all this time, no one has told me the truth about food and where it comes from and what happens to make it and the cost it, is, the cost it has on the earth and on lives of people in all these countries that can't eat because we're stealing food from them and feeding it to animals and it's an inefficient use of resources. So this was really, really alarming to me. And so I went vegan that day. And um, I also had the revelation because I was sitting with my dog and he was my best friend, my dog that I rescued on a set where I was doing a movie. And actually I was on the set with my brother David and I met this dog, Samson, we named him Samson. But he was amazing, and he was my boyfriend. He slept with me, we made out, he, um, he did everything with me. And so what it occurred to me, the same thing that happened in The Witness, where he was rubbing the legs of the chicken, I'm sorry, rubbing the legs of his cat, and then, um, you can rub the legs of chickens too though, I have since, um, but he was rubbing the, uh, the legs of his cat, and he was making the connection with the meal that he ha was in front of him, which was a chicken breast, the same feeling. And, so I had a similar thing where suddenly I was with my dog, holding him, cuddling with him, kissing him, snuggled up with him and thought, why am I so kind to this creature that I love so much when I, these other creatures that have the same capacity for joy and the same capacity to make you laugh and don't want to be punched in the face or have a knife you know, stabbed into them, they all have the same feelings as my dog, so what's the difference? So for me, this was my awakening. And I don't expect anybody else to have this feeling about animals, but if you tap into your young self, chances are you felt this way when you were little and didn't want animals to be harmed. So at 21, I made this choice, and I, I did it. And what happened was a miracle. because Well, it turns out it's not a miracle. It's actually scientifically and medically sound, but it felt like a miracle and certainly great karma because what happened to me was my skin changed. Suddenly, now that I was vegan, 
My skin was glowing. My eyes got really white. I had an asthma inhaler that I used for, um, well, I had to have asthma inhaler like three times a day, allergy shots uh, twice a week. I had acne. I was starting to get a little bit plump. In my industry, they were calling me fat girl, which is really nice because I was in bat girl. Um, I get it. And so, um, <laughs> so this was fun. And so now that I was vegan, and at the time, you know, if you had told me when they were calling me fat girl, I was so un unwilling to change my eating habits. Uh, people would try and talk to me about dieting, and I just, I was really rebellious at this time in my life. I suppose there's a rebellious streak in me at all times, but I just was like, no, I'm not, you know, don't tell me what my body should look like, don't tell me how I should be, I, no. And I, I really had a hard time with it. But the animals saved me. That's why I say it's like good karma because my love for these animals made me suddenly, like my started to slim down. My weight changed drastically. My skin started to glow. I ditched the asthma inhaler, no longer needed allergy shots. My nails at the time were very brittle. And now I challenge anyone to bend my nail. You cannot, it, they're hard as a rock. And that was all just from changing my diet. So, um, I thought, this is really incredible. And I remember my allergist called a year later and said to me, why aren't you coming in anymore for your shots? And I said, I don't need them anymore. I don't have allergies anymore. And he said, well, what have you done? And I said, I, I went vegan. And he said, oh, I've heard that really works. And I said, well, then why didn't you tell me? And he was like, well, then I wouldn't have a practice. And he was sort of, this was all a funny conversation. But... Um, <laughs> But the truth is, it did change my health drastically. And I started to have not only this incredible health benefits, but my um, core, my spirit started to really calm because all the gook that was inside of my body was now out. And I was able to feel differently. I could, I could, I remember people used to say, ask your body what it wants, like your body speaks to you. And I'd say, how does your body speak to you? What are you talking about? But then I started to understand that when you have all the gook out of you, you can really tap into your heart and follow your truth. And so it started to really open me up. And I had tons of self-worth issues. I'm sure we all struggle with this stuff. But I had so much of it. And doing this started to really give me a sense of purpose because now I was able to say no to something that I believed in. It's very difficult to say no, definitely for women. I don't know how it is for men because I'm not a man. But... I'm imagining it's difficult for all of us, but it's a tricky thing to say, I don't want to do that. This is not okay with me. But me standing in my power and saying simply, I am not willing to look at myself in the mirror, say I'm a good person, say I love animals, and then be responsible for the uh, you know, suffering and uh, torture of them. That choice alone gave me so much power as a female. And so it started this whole kind of awakening for me. And I was walking around in the world lighter just lighter, like, <sighs> I mean, I cannot tell you what those first three weeks were like. And people would stop me on the streets, and not on the streets, but people I knew who would see me and say, oh my goodness, like, what has happened? You changed. You seem really different. You're glowing, things like that. So those were all good things to hear. So I'm going to look at my notes to see where I want to go. So that was sort of my health journey. And um, I want to just say that also another little thing that happened along the way. So after I had made this choice and was on this journey, I got really lonely in this choice because there weren't a lot of people who were doing this at the time, not that I knew. And I felt really kind of isolated because everywhere I wanted to go when I was doing press, all I wanted to talk about was anal electrocution and nasty things like that, which nobody wants to hear about. And I would just say the worst things, but I was like, rape, murder, everywhere I went, fire. And all of those things are true. It's just, it's not really that helpful when you're trying to turn people on. So um, I was feeling really isolated and I kept running into Woody Harrelson at these events that we would go to for um, animal rights events. And I just thought, I need a friend in this. So I, I called him. I didn't want to talk to him that day, I was too shy. So I called him and I just said, hi, I got your number. and. I just need help, like the cows and the pigs. Can we talk about it? And he said, do you want to, in his woody way, do you want to come to Peru? I can't do his accent or his voice, but, you know, do you want to come to Peru with me and my wife? And, like, we can just go save the rainforest together? And I was like, yeah, I do. And so we met in the Lima airport on this journey to save the rainforest by, 
you know, they were cu they were clear cutting everywhere for animal agriculture. But we also wanted to help these people to know that when people come and say, "Hey, <clears throat> we'll give you this amount of money for your land," rather than taking the the quick answer and taking that money, instead use the Brazil nut trees that are in your land and teach them how to reuse the an the 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 resources that they have, and that that would be more valuable along the way. So this was an amazing effort. But on this trip, he and I bonded and became really really dear friends. He's still my dear friend today. And one time we were in Hawaii together, and um, he said to me, um, "I was we are, this was kind of bizarre, but we were all hanging out naked, whatever. And <laughs> as you do. And uh, he and his wife and kids and me and my husband, but he was my boyfriend, I think, at the time. <clears throat> and um, we were all just, you know, hanging out. And I d we decided to take baths. There were two baths outside next to each other. So he and his wife were in one bath. I was in the other bath, just hanging out. Nothing weird going on, I swear. And then... Um, and then his kids wanted to get in my bath. And I said, oh, yeah, Danny, Zoe, come get in the bath with me. And he was like, uh-uh, they can't get in the bath with you. Why? He said, because you have chemicals in your bathtub. What do you mean I have chemicals in my bathtub? He said, look at all the products you're using. I said, but I'm reusing them because I don't want to waste them. They were given to me. He said, yeah, but when you use them, all those chemicals are going into your skin. And all those chemicals are going into the earth. And I don't want them going into my kid's skin. So he was like, you know, next bath. Get rid of those products. And this really started me on a whole other track. I never considered the environment. I was so keen on animal, agri you know, animal agriculture, saving animals, that I never thought about the environmental impact of all of this. So what I'm so excited about environmentally is that the same choice that saves animals ends suffering and makes your body healthier and heals you is also um, better for the earth. You know, we have climate change is a very real thing, and we have about 10 to 12 years to fix this problem, I'm sure you're all aware. And 51% of climate change is because of animal agriculture. And this has been a dirty secret for a very long time that all, many of us have known, but they're not telling you. So even environmentalists are trying to, like, not have to face this. Even when we were in the Amazon River watching with the scientists, we were with scientists on this trip, and we were watching the clear-cutting for uh, raising of cattle, as we were going into the, and we were deep in the Amazon River, I mean, somebody got shot with an arrow, a bow and arrow, just the day before we got there, because there's Indians, this is how deep we were in the area, and, um, you know, the, the scientists would call us, like, the sappy little vegans, like, oh, you guys care about animals, and we were like, yes, and the earth, and he was in denial, the scientist who could see it right in front of him, anyway, there's many scientists that are not in denial, and he's probably awake now, too, um, but so the environmental impact of this diet is so profound. And um, another aspect of that is if you think about when you, I just love this little fact, when you have a pound of steak, just one 16-ounce steak, the amount of resources that it takes to create that steak is like six months showering water. Could, fill, could feed an entire village of people. So there's a really brilliant speaker who spoke in, par in, in parliament uh, a very unsuspecting hero, uh, sort of corporate, rep um, not Republican, um, re conservative type man speaking out in the most passionate way about how if you care about hungry people, you must stop eating animals because the plant-based foods are not taking the food away from people. There's enough food on the planet right now to feed all of us, but we're feeding it to animals instead, and that is not working because they take way more food than that one mouth does. So, um, so it's a really important thing environmentally. Um, the other thing I just want to say is it's really delicious. So I know that a long time ago we all thought that eating plant-based food meant really boring tofu and really boring lentils, although I really like those ingredients, and if you know how to cook with them, they're amazing. But you don't have to eat those ever if you don't want to. I'm a food snob, and when I gave up animal food. I remember doing this, and I'm Jewish, so it makes absolutely no sense, but I did that thinking like, okay, I'm never gonna eat yummy food again. I may not even live, and <laughs> but this is the right thing to do. And the, the irony in all of that is that it was the thing that saved me and made me the healthiest, most vibrant version of myself, so that I'm not getting older, I'm getting younger inside of my, of course I have some getting older business, I am older, but. I am more vibrant now than I was at 19 years old. We don't all have to fall apart as we get older. You can heal and nourish your body so that you're getting stronger and stronger as you age. And of course, some things will kick in, like your eyesight. You might, uh, I don't know, 
fall down, then you need to go to the hospital and get your leg fixed, whatever. There are things that happen, but most things are managed. Heart disease, cancer, diabetes, lupus, migraines. There are so many things that, just if you can't poop, most people can't even poo. Like you should be having great bowel movements twice a day. And most people, I have friends that go for so long without this. So I'm able to give them a little prescription of how to change that. And then they start pooping really beautifully. So, um, so I just, there's so, you know, migraines, anything like uh, PMS, all of it is managed through diet. And so that's why the Kind Diet was born because so many people were asking me for help and I was writing so many little baby prescriptions of what to do to change. And finally someone said, for goodness sakes, just write a book. So, um, Anyway, I was just going to say that it's delicious. That was my point. Um, I wrote The Kind Diet and The Kind Mama, and in both books, I feel like what I offer differently. I remember Oprah asked me to be on her show because she loved the recipes that she had tried from my book. And that was really awesome being on Oprah, by the way. Um, but she, uh, she and others who are were afraid of vegan food, because it sounds gross if you don't know about it, were really impressed with the food. And, and when I think about the fact that, you know, you could have a plate of whatever your favorite meat stuff is. Let's say it's steak and potatoes or whatever it is. And then you have this other plate of insanely delicious food. Like, I don't know, I make really yummy things, but like leek and um, pesto mushroom croak um, on little, uh, what do you call that? Baguette. Um, delicious things that if you have both uh, one plate over here that's really delicious and another plate over here that's really delicious but one of those plates is harmful to the earth harmful to your body torturing animals and taking the food away from people and all over the all over the world and this other plate that nourishes the soil gives back to the earth feeds everyone makes you your healthiest is kind to animals. It, to me, that's just a duh, no-brainer. So the point is trying to find really great food. And I, ha I can tell you that being a food snob, the, there is no, this is a no-deprivation diet. I eat really well, and if I don't like it, I don't, I don't eat it. And um, so I want to just say that the recipes in the book are delicious, and you don't have to fear not having your favorite foods. And anything can be converted to make it just as good. And there's even Romage now, which is this guy from Paris who makes, he lives in Los Angeles, and he makes cheese, and it's divine cheese. And here you have Miyoko's, which is really good, but Romage is really, you have to taste that. Um, so how this, what I wrote The Kind Diet, and, and what's cool about The Kind Diet is, if you aren't familiar with it at all, is that it's not asking you to make, to go all the way. It's as, it's just giving, you can even eat a burger while you read it. Just, I mean, I don't recommend eating a burger, but if you need to, it's a book that will make you feel um, really like you're having a conversation with a friend, and all the medical science and um, statistics is all backed by Harvard studies and incredible research and it's all footnoted so you can find out everything you need to know but it's just I told it in a way that I would want to receive it because all the books I read before the kind diet and the reason I wrote the book was I didn't have a book I could give there was books that were too heady and there were books there were so many books and so many brilliant books with so much great information but what I wanted was that book that would be easy for you to read enjoyable um, easy to process and or easy to digest and so that you could really come away informed and when you're informed just make the best choices you can it's not all or nothing so you could end the book and decide to be a flirt or you could read the book and decide I want to go all the way or you could go even further and become a superhero which is if any of you have any kind of ailments if you're struggling with any health issues I promise you you follow the superhero diet just a week, you'll notice a difference. And if you keep going, there's a woman, Mina Dobik, who was dying of cancer, and she was in, um, she was given two months to live. And I think at the time she was about 45, and she was a newscaster and very stubborn. And she wouldn't listen to anybody who told her anything about her health, but she was in this hospital, because that's where she felt comfortable. And now they told her she had two months to live. So she left there and finally listened to this woman who helped her change her diet. And she cured herself back. And thir that's been 30 years now, I think, or maybe 20. I don't know if it's 20 or 30 years, but she's a macrobiotic counselor. And she's how she's incredible. She has a book called um, My Beautiful Life. She's not alone. There are so many stories like this. And in my book, I kind of chronicle all the people, many people that I know who have cured themselves of lupus and MS and these things and cancer and 
And also bodybuilders. The cool thing is you start to realize there's all these MMA fighters who are vegan. And they're not vegan because they care about animals. They're not vegan because they care about the earth. They don't even care about starving children. I mean, they might care, but that's not why they're doing it. They care about performance and inflammation. And they've learned that recovery is the most important thing for them. So these athletes have chosen to change their diet so they get the best results. And by the way, Bruce Lee was a vegetarian. So um, there are all these incredible people doing this in all different ways. I mean, even Bill Clinton, right? He, he had the four, was it a quadruple bypass surgery and his daughter grabbed him and said listen if you want to live this is what you need to do and he's changed his diet and he's thriving um so then the kind mama is a book that i wrote about if you know anyone trying to get pregnant or anyone who is pregnant it's going when i was pregnant i would go to these uh yoga classes mommy and me classes and i would sit there and women would talk about all these things that they were experiencing they were having you know the usual common things they were really moody they were having uh, their ankles were swelling they had uh, gestational diabetes they had um cramps they had uh all kinds of things that happen when you're, oh, hemorrhoids, all the fun stuff. And I had none of it. And I was like, and Woody's wife was the first example to me of someone who had, um, you know, raised children differently than I had seen. Her kids were really free and they went to Waldorf schools and they were, you know, coming over. We were in Ireland cooking and they would, the kids would just walk over and grab a plate of, there would be, I'd put kale on the table, a big plate of cooked kale. And the kids would walk over and like walk away eating it as if it was candy. And this was so interesting to me. So I, they were my first example of what it was to have these really healthy kids and, um, and to have a really vibrant pregnancy. And then I had another example, my friend Lilania, another kind mama was at a restaurant on the day she gave birth and she just came in and she was like, I'm supposed to give birth soon. And her eyes were bright and she was so happy and not, not, I got to get this thing out of me. None of that. Just like, you know, gorgeous in her body, glowy and like ready. And that day she gave birth. So I had these examples along the way and now it was my turn. And I experienced the same thing and was not needing Bear to come out. I was like, I want be, I'll be happy when I meet him, but I'm happy this way too for as long as it needs to be. And that's, I had none of the ailments, these common ailments. So, uh, the, the kind mama was really written to help people boost their fertility, get them pregnant. Because if, if your baby house is all gunked up, nobody wants to make a baby in there. You know, it's not, it's not going to work. Um, so you need to clean that. You know, when we go, there's so much medicine in, in birth, which is such a natural thing and doesn't need, we treat it like an illness instead of going, wait a second, the reason you're not getting pregnant is because of what you're doing to your body. Let's start with what's going on from a holistic point of view, F feel your body out, and then you'll be able to have ba a baby. So this book, Boosts Your Fertility, helps you not have the ailments that are commonly known. Um, and so then along the way, while I was pregnant, I, I wanted, my midwife said, you need to take a, a prenatal. And I said, well, I don't, I don't need prenatals. I eat so clean. Very arrogant. Um, and she said, well, what about when you're traveling or it's too hard to get what you need? And why not just have it as an insurance policy? So I said, okay, that makes sense to me. I will do that. Let me go look for one. So I started looking for a vitamin. What vitamin can I take? There was nothing on the market that was as clean as how I eat. This was very disturbing to me. It was like another mini version of learning about food industry wait a second, when you buy vitamins, they're supposed to be healthy. That's the whole point, right? How could this vitamin from not be healthy for me? So, um, so I, and, and how they were unhealthy is that they would say organic, but then they'd be packet, want, they'd have a few in, in organic ingredients, but then they'd be wrapped in sterate or wrapped in some kind of chemical. And this didn't make any sense to me. So it disturbed me and I decided to go, for, I was like, this has to change. If I need this, everybody needs this. So I start, I went looking for a partner and I found this company, Garden of Life, and they, were, they weren't doing what I wanted to be doing, but they were excited about the journey. And they said, yes, we want to do this with you. We will partner with you and we'll create them with you. So we spent three years trying to develop these because we needed to come up with an entirely new technology for these tablets, a clean tab. We actually innovated this um, uh, process called clean tablet technology. So all of my kind organics, which are the vitamins that I make, are certified organic, non-GMO verified, 100% food based. When you read the label, it's got broccoli, red peppers, lemons, like you can read what it says 
there's nothing in it, you don't know what it is. It's all food. And um, there's no binders or fillers, it's just clean food, and so you can really trust it. And then we started doing, and we have everything you could need, uh, collagen, and it's, we don't use collagen, it's a collagen builder to get your insides working, So because you can't take collagen, that doesn't do anything. That's a whole scam. You have to build the collagen within yourself by building your body back up. And then um, we wanted to make gummies, because gummies are delicious, but all the gummies on the market are made with sugar. And so um, what we did was make them without. We used uh, apple and peach puree, and that's our pectin that we use instead of gelatin, because gelatin is so nasty. It's like a bunch of uh, leftover slaughterhouse pieces of guts and parts of animals, and they spray it. They just pour acid on it. That's gross, and then we eat that. I'm not into that. And, um, and then with my herbals, what we need, I found, yeah, it's not cool. So then I found out with the herbals, you know, like turmeric and all of these really incredible um, adaptogens that are very popular, ashwagandha, um, all of these things, what they're doing is they're, t they, most people aren't using organic materials to begin with, but let's say they are. Then they're processing them, the extraction, the extraction process, they're using hexane, which is gasoline, and they're using, uh, GMO corn oil. So again, I'm like, wh why would my vitamins have gasoline and, and GMO corn oil in the process? Not into it. So we had to spend a lot of time trying to create uh, these really pure, clean um, adaptogens and uh, turmeric and all of these things that you can we extract using water which was revolutionary somehow, but it took a long time to figure that out, that you could do that. And then um, also a non-GMO corn oil, uh, certified organic, when, when absolutely necessary. So I'm really proud of my, my kind organics, and it was a really important passion project for me. And um, I basically, what that's, uh, this sort of all of these things have paved the way for this sort of, you know, um, this different lifestyle and a different kind of career. I sort of took a big break from acting because I was writing books that take so long and doing all these ideas and now I can do both, which is great. Um, but I, at the time, sort of took this big break. Um, okay, let's see. But anyway, so we were the first ever to make sustainable vitamins that were, I mean, even the bottles. I mean, I designed the labels as best I could within the restrictions I had, um, but they, uh, but I think they're quite beautiful. They're all made with recycled glass and recycled plastics, and um, and they have, the labels are soy ink, and everything's recycled, and even we know the farmers, we are all, use, you know, super sustainable organic farmers, so it's really nice. Okay, let me see what else do I want to tell you about. Um, so... Also, if, and if you do decide to take a stab at any of this kind of lifestyle and you need any help uh, knowing how to feed your kids or knowing how to uh, do any of this stuff, I have, I'm on all the social platforms. And on my Instagram story, I, I often show like what we're eating for dinner so you can get a sense of how to feed your, feed your kids. And you see through my son how much he loves this and how proud of it he is and, you know, so my Instagram stories, the website, thekindlife.com, it's all the kind life. Um, but my Instagram is Alicia Silverstone. So if you need help or, and you can always direct message me and ask me questions and I can help. Um, I'll talk a little bit about the environmental choices I've made for my own life. You know, I don't want to use plastic bottles, for goodness sakes. I try so hard. So I carry this little thing everywhere and refill it and refill it and refill it. And, you know, we just cannot afford to use plastic anymore. We cannot afford to be so um, disposable in our culture. So, you know, I that's with water bottles. I have a filter in my home. That's the best thing you can do. And you just keep filling your bottle. I've been doing this for like 20 years. Um, my clothes, you know, everything I have is, this is from, I think these are from The Real Real, which is a used clothing store. Um, all my underwear and socks are from Packed Organics, which is organic, uh, stuff. This is from a sustainable company. This I got used from like, you know, a thrift store. So I'm really mindful with everything I purchase because I don't want to create new stuff. We have too much stuff. We really need very little, right? So um, every purchase I make, I think, okay, if my son wants, I don't know, he wanted Nerf guns. So rather than buying new Nerf guns, I go, okay, I'm going to go on eBay and find used er Nerf guns. Oh, we need... Um, we need batteries. Great. I'm going to buy rechargeable, reusable batteries. 
Um, I use cloth throughout my whole house, cloth napkins. But then there's the bigger picture things like solar panels. I've got those. Gray water, you know, gray water is so important. If you, if you have a property, it really saves so much water. So how does this all connect to cannabis? You're probably wondering why is she here and what's she talking about? Um, it's just simply that I, you know, I, all of this, this is my lifestyle choosing responsibly, choosing sustainable materials, being thoughtful about every single thing that I do and purchase. And it sounds like a headache, but it's really quite amazing. And it sort of narrows things down because there's so much to choose from and it's so overwhelming, right? Just with your beauty products, for God's sakes. There's just so much. So when you sort of say like, no chemicals, no destruction to the earth, no hurting animals. It just sort of narrows the playing field in a great focused way. And so then you're, I, I have such high standards about these products that I want them to be the cleanest, most beautiful, smelling, tasting. You know, it has to be chic and wonderful, just as good as all the regular stuff, but better. And so this journey has turned me, this is sort of my, entrep I've become an entrepreneur in this front, but I've also, um, it's just my lifestyle. It's the way I live. And how cannabis fits into all of that is obviously this plant is incredibly sustainable. I mean, the resources used in comparison to cotton, you probably all know, is astounding. It's such a super, super, super crop. So I, you know, this, I don't have my backpack right here, but my little backpack that I've been carrying, well, I used to wear a, a hemp backpack through all of my 20s. And I've brought it back because my son, we were in Hawaii and he wanted a hemp, we were in a hemp store and he wanted a hemp backpack. So I was like, of course you can have a hemp backpack. We never buy anything. But if you want this, yes. Um, so like he doesn't have, to it's not like, I'm not saying he's like this freak who doesn't have anything, but I'm just saying we, he, he's playing with blocks and dirt and helping me cook and like create, you know, creating stuff, art, pro he's just so incredible, and he has no, every toy that comes into the house because somebody gives it to him, they play with them for four seconds, and then they're done, so he's, I just, we've never bought any toys ever, um, and if we do, we get them used, so um, I thought, if I'm going to let him buy something, it's going to be a hemp backpack, well, I stole it from him by accident, because it was so cool, and I was like, I remember how it was to have a backpack, I love it, so I wear it all the time, and it's the strongest, most sturdy material, um, and also, I, I had a line of cosmetics that I did. I don't have it anymore, but I did it for, uh, sorry, this was another project. I had, I, for three years, I did a partnership with a company called EcoTools, and we made like bamboo makeup brushes, and uh, it was all responsibly made. But one of the things we did was make these beautiful bags. And for three years, we had three different collections, and I made sure that the materials were hemp, because of course, we have, it was the most wonderful material and they're so beautiful these bags um so and of course soy ink and all the stuff but recycled plastics but the hemp was the was the the material i chose and would always choose um so i i've i've been a fan of hemp for decades and so many so many reasons um obviously the footprint the environmental footprint is so low and, um, you know, the other thing about hemp I think is amazing is that it doesn't require any agro uh, chemicals. So, you know, it, it actually feeds the soil. The plant is saying, I'm going to make this earth healthier, which is incredible. So I really like that. And, um, and what else do I want to tell you? Well, obviously, in your food, I use it in hemp milk. I have hemp milk. I use hemp seeds on my salads and things like that um, because... It's an excellent source of protein and omegas, you know, all your essential fatty acids, vitamin E, iron, um, and you can use it in your smoothies. Um, but then they're also, you know, you all probably know this stuff. I don't know how much everyone is familiar, but, you know, they're also doing uh, building materials now with hemp, uh, fuel and auto parts. And so it's a seriously important crop and especially, you know, it's a kind crop. It's truly kind to the planet and for our health. And there's just too many applications to ignore. And it's really a damn shame that it's taken this long for us to be allowed to use it um, because it's, it's so important. I mean, I couldn't, I remember when I was doing my bags, we couldn't even have it made in the States at that time. It's ridiculous. Um, you know, especially with global warming and where we are at this tipping point, we should be using it 
everywhere. Um, it's so crucial. And there's going to be a, a talk uh, tomorrow, I believe, at 3 o'clock about all of this. So check it out because I think that would be really incredible. Um, I'm super jazzed that I got to be here. And like I said, you can find me on my platforms and ask me questions. And um, what else do I want to say? Um, oh, I'm going to do a book signing if you want to come to that. And if anybody has any questions, please ask me. <laughs> I think I understand what you're saying, that um, perhaps are they, like, for example, in movies, will they talk about how people use it for seizures? And maybe would they talk about, like, a character using it for well, healthier... Will they not only, will they not only talk about it, but will they um, depict it? Yeah, I mean, I'm not the creator of all movies. Right. <laughs> so I won't be able to tell you what everyone's going to do very common knowledge at this point that people are using CBD uh, and medicinal marijuana for medicinal purposes. So I can't imagine that people who are making film, I think it's always fun to make stoner movies because they're funny, like James Franco and um, what's his name? Seth, Seth, Seth Rogen. I mean, that's a fun movie. <laughs> like, I don't want them not to make that movie. Um, but I think that obviously anyone doing any storytelling from this point on would not ignore the true uh, way in which people are using it. But like I said, I'm not responsible for the entire film industry, so, or not even any of it. So, um, so uh, but I think, yes, sorry, that would be good. Does anybody else have a question? Well, both of you, but who would be? Yes. Um, and this is not the face of our industry. 
history at all, mm -hmm. and it's the it's all media to sort of update their reference file yeah. and start showing this industry for what it is, which kind of looks like the room we're in right now. It looks like yeah, none of you look like stoners. So, <laughs> so <laughs> on um, the previous part of the question, it's an important question, and I'm yes. sure that you're not in charge of all the movies. That's a little disappointing. <laughs> yeah, I know, but isn't still, it? We have, but I want to ask a question about food because I'm, yeah. I'm a some ways I find my body still can't quite, it needs that, it feels like, I feel like I'm missing something in terms of my own how I feel, and mm -hmm. the best, I agree, the best measure of wellness is how you feel, right. so I say I can tell a lot by how I slept in the first half hour of my day, if I use the bathroom, if I'm efficient, and I'm going to have a great day, I feel better. So I've been feeling like, is fish a better alternative? For those of us ah. that are concerned about animal cruelty, yeah. that are concerned about the fact that we're feeding animals cereal About that great question both of your questions were great questions um, I think that I would love to see what you were eating first before we diagnosed that you needed fish um, because beans are if you look at I don't know how much beans are in your life but if you aren't having a cup at least of beans a day especially for a man and like uh, nut pro nut nut butters and um, fatty oils from avocados uh, these are important foods for men and women, yeah, but men and so. But every day you need to get the beans in there, and that can come in the form any bean. Beans are the most incredible food because, see, I wish I had my. I don't have a power presentation point. I'm working on it, but I have this amazing uh, little chart in the Kind Diet and in the Kai Mama of calcium and of protein. Because all these myths about, like if you were to take, if you look at steak or meat, animal protein and you look at it next to um, beans, beans win on every account. It's unbelievable because they have, what they do is they give you a really, really valuable amount of protein, the same as you're going to get from the animal, but it doesn't have to do all that work in your body. So it it processes very efficiently and quickly. This is why the athletes are using them. So I'm not talking about going out and having veggie burgers instead. I mean, as a transition food, this is in the kind diet, we go through like flirting, and then there's vegan, which is like transition foods. To, but the superheroes, the real like wellness, when I have to thrive, when I'm going to work, I want to be clear-minded, I want to feel my best, then it's it's beans and tempeh as my, as my protein. And... I would say that if you did that, you would find that mostly you never needed fish. But as a man, and I hate saying this, but as a man, you might still need a little bit of fish here and there. But I don't think that's necessary. And I don't think, I also, for me, for example, fish is not a healthy choice given what's happening in the ocean. There's no clean fish. Now, on a, that's on a, sustain, on a sustainable level. It's very difficult to find sustainable. I mean, there are what they say more sustainably raised, um, uh, caught fish, but it's very difficult. It's still not perfect. And then even if it is sustainable, it's still going to have all the nastiness of the ocean. You can't control what's going into the ocean. The, even our salt has plastic in it right now. So imagine what the fish have in it. They're not healthy. So And, and they're not. I hate this concept that somehow fish are more unhealthy than cows and pigs because that's not, you know, that's being marketed to you as well. Don't eat fish because of the mercury, so you got to eat land animals. No, it's all not. Plants are where it's at. That's what Hippocrates was saying. 500, how long ago? Long time ago, 5,000. Um, Jesus was talking about plants. He was going around healing people with grain and plants. So I think that this is an ancient old way of healing. And I think that, but I do think when I make, so let's say I'm away. I was just in Ibiza and in Paris. And this was a very fabulous trip. 
with a ton of meat eaters, all my friends. I wasn't going to veggie joints. It was hard to find anything. And I, sometimes I would have a bite of, like if there was an oyster or a scallop. Now the way I kind of rationalize this from an animal point of view is they don't have a mommy, they don't have eyes, and they don't have a heart. So I'm like, it's kind of like a mushroom. <laughs> But I still don't feel great about it, okay? I'm just going to be honest. It doesn't feel great to me, but it feels better. So, but I don't need it. It's not, it's not doing anything to me. It just, it's just me being selfish and wanting the taste. But as a man, energetically, if, you were, if I could feed you for a month and show you how to get the, really the beans in there, the tempeh in there, every day... One of, you know, one of those. And I'm talking black bean tacos, hummus. Um, I, f I feed my son. He's eight years old. He's actually never been to a, he's never had any medicine. He's eight years old. So that's quite incredible. Most kids by this age have had a million ear infections. You know, they're sick. They always get sick. He's just never been down. And when he gets a cold, he's like still running up the mountain. Do you know what I mean? He's like got snot running, but he's like so vibrant. So he, um, we, I make sure every single day he has beans, he gets seaweed, because I want him to have the nori, the dulse, the arame. Those are the things that are going to make your skin so good and your brain, the omegas. Um, this is such an important food. So in the Kind Diet, you can look and see how maybe you can add some of these superfoods that will really, you know, immune-boosting foods, nourishing your organs. I think you'll feel way better if you go superhero first and try that and see how that feels. And then if you must, maybe fish twice a week. But I don't really think it's necessary. And I don't think it's kinder to the earth or kinder to animals or any of those things. But I do somehow prefer that to all the other creatures. And I know that sounds terrible, but if you're going to make that choice, I feel like that's the one. I, okay. Oh, no. Sorry. She had one question. She, no, they're not. They're going to kick me out. Um, okay. Thanks, you guys, so much.